yesterday. We had beautiful weather in the uh, southeastern Pennsylvania uh, part of the state, and especially in Ogden and Boothwin, Upper Chichester, etc. And today we have rain, but uh, we have the sunshine in our heart uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we welcome you, and we're going to begin our service at this time with a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for your goodness. We're thankful for your mercies. We are thankful for the rain. Lord, I'm reminded of the little song our children learned when they were little. Uh, sunshine and rain, sunshine and rain. We all need the sunshine and rain. And Lord, we're thankful for the sunshine that is in our hearts through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our time together uh, with this uh, media forum, uh, broadcasting uh, to those who have needs of spiritual uh, growth and, and spiritual needs to be met. We pray, Lord, that the Word of God would find good ground in their hearts and in our hearts and bring forth fruit to your glory, that you would bring peace uh, to those who are, might be filled with anxiety, that you would bring salvation to those who may need to trust Christ as their Savior, hope to those who are discouraged, and wisdom to those who are seeking a word of wisdom, Lord. We pray that you would uh, bless our live stream and that we'd have no technical issues and that those that are listening might be able to listen without problems as well. Bring glory to yourself through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This time, Andrew Locke will come and lead us in a hymn. Please sing with me, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
Thank you, Andrew. Hope that you uh, enjoyed singing along. We've uh, put the words there and trust that you'll join us. Hopefully our telephone audience uh, via conference call can hear the music a little bit better th this week. We've made a few changes. We brought the piano uh, toward the uh, area of the auditorium that we're using in the small auditorium and also have Andrew coming in front of the video camera today. Last week they were at the opposite side, so we've made some improvements there. We have a few announcements to make. Uh, one is uh, we want to thank uh, Pastor Troy Prater and Matt Hubert. They are at the controls today making this possible, and you can uh, give them a big uh, thank you later. Uh, not during the service, it distracts them. Um, and then um, also uh, pray that everything goes well there. And then Andrew's uh, our song leader. We're very grateful for him. A uh, great blessing he is. And then my wife's at the piano uh, today, and she's a great blessing as well. We also want to thank everyone who's been mailing their offerings uh, to the church. Uh, we've been able to continue our full uh, commitments to our missionaries and to our other ministries that we support without uh, any problems. And so we do want to thank. We are below budget, obviously, for the year, but uh, we're not concerned or worried, and we're thankful for your generous offerings uh, of that. Uh, we also have a few families uh, connected with our church that has had some deaths uh, as well uh, related to COVID-19 and of some other deaths not related to COVID-19. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Father, uh, we are so thankful for our first responders. Uh, we are thankful, Lord, for our firefighters, our EMTs, our ambulance drivers, our uh, police officers. We're thankful, Lord, for the nurses. We have several nurses uh, who are members of our church, Lord, that work in ERs. We have custodial staff who works in the ER and other parts of the hospital, and we have volunteer firemen, Lord. We're, we're so thankful for them and, and their willingness to put their lives in harm's way on a daily basis, and now even more so with this pandemic. Uh, we do ask, Lord, for those who do not have the virus, that you would continue to protect them. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, work out the pro give our leaders wisdom and the hospital administration wisdom to work out the complications with the supply chain so that they can get all the protective gear that they need. Uh, we do pray, Lord, for those families who've lost loved ones. We ask, Lord, that the, the grace of God would comfort them and the mercy of God would comfort them. And you'd wrap your loving arms around them and make them aware of your presence. We pray, Lord, that you would bring uh, comforters to them, even though they have to be a little bit afar. Lord, we know there's a couple of funerals in our community uh, on Monday. Uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, those would go without any problems, no traffic accidents. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort those families as well. We do pray, Lord, for those firemen uh, that are in quarantine and first responders that are in quarantine, uh, both in our community and throughout the nation, that you would give them a full and complete recovery, Lord, uh, from this virus. And we pray, Lord, that you would help their, parent, their, their parents and their, their wives and their children not to be filled with anxiety uh, during this time, but comfort them as only you alone can comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, Andrew will come and lead us in the hymn, The Solid Rock. Before we uh, sing this song, I'd like to invite you, those of you that are at home and in a position where you can do this, uh, to please stand as we sing The Solid Rock. It might be helpful given the words of the uh, chorus. His oath, his covenant, his blood support. 
found Dressed in his righteousness alone Bought less to stand before the throne On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Please be seated. Oh, and uh, next we have a trumpet and piano duet by Andrew Locke and Alexandra Tichigas. Thank you, Alexandra and Andrew. They came in earlier in the week and uh, took, uh, uh, I don't know how much time, but they spent a lot of time uh, making sure that that uh, was suitable for what we needed to do technologically for today, and we're very thankful for them. Uh, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. I trust that you realize that uh, that means each one of us. Uh, daily, we're debtors to Jesus Christ, who alone paid for the penalty of our sin and bought uh, our salvation and that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his blood, death, burial, and resurrection and uh, not by our own works. I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm chapter 62. Psalm chapter 62. Our Psalm sermon title this morning is uh, God Our Rock and our theme this morning is God Alone is our refuge and salvation during crisis. God alone is our refuge and salvation during crisis. Father, we pray now as we open the word of God that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that it would find good ground and bring forth fruit to your glory. Mold us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ into his image by the way we live and the decisions we make and uh, the way we talk, Lord, Help us to be like Jesus by your grace and by your power. We pray that you'd meet the spiritual needs of everyone today who's watching uh, uh, or listening to this message. And may you bring glory to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Please again take your Bibles. Uh, Psalm 62. <clears throat> to the chief musician, to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. 
Truly my soul waits upon God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing, as a bowing wall or a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all time, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity. And men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongs mercy, for thou rendest to every man according to his work. God our rock. I hope that in the time of this pandemic that you understand that God and God alone is your rock, that God and God alone is your protector. God alone is our rock and our salvation during a time of crisis. And so this morning, Lord willing, with time permitting, we're going to look at how that we need to rest in God when enemies assault us. Number two, we need to trust God always. And number three, judgment day will put everything in perspective. No doubt you remember exactly where you were on September 11th of 2001 when our nation was attacked by Al-Qaeda. Perhaps you suffered a, a huge loss in your retirement program in the global financial crisis of 2008. You may have lost your job or, or lost your house during that crisis and you still remember the great sufferings and hardships you went through at that time. Today, we're in another type of a crisis known as COVID-19 pandemic. To date, over 200,000 people have died and entered into eternity in the last few months due to coronavirus. One out of six workers in the United States have either lost their jobs or been laid off. Families are facing fear and anxiety and hardship and difficult. It is, not, it is not unusual for people to panic during a crisis. It is not unusual for people to struggle with fear or anxiety at such a time of crisis. Christians are not exempt from facing fear. Christians are not exempt from facing the, the temptation of uh, anxiety. In Matthew's Gospel and the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus Christ told us that the storms of life would come upon both types of people, both those who build their lives on the sand and those who dig deep and build their lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. The storm still comes to both. My question today for all of us is, how will you face your fears? How will you face those anxious moments? I hope it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope it's in the God of the heavens and God of the universe who said, let there be light and there was light and who formed the earth and all that is therein. Alan Ross wrote the following. This psalm reflects David's confident trust in the Lord in spite of opposition. In silence, he waited for God, his strength and his security to deliver him from the deceitful enemies. The psalm contrasts the security of trusting God with the insecurity of relying on human devices. The psalm falls basically into three stanzas of four verses each. And so first, I want us to consider that since God and God alone is our refuge and salvation during crisis, that we need to rest in God when enemies assault us. The identity of David's enemies in this psalm are not named specifically. Some believe that his own son, Absalom, was his enemy during the coup d'etat, which 
uh, he orchestrated against his father when David and his allies had to flee Jerusalem for their very lives. You know, we all have enemies. Some people will dislike you because you try to share with them their need for salvation. Some people will dislike you because you will not participate in their wicked lifestyle. Some people will despise you and hate you because you will not condone or affirm their wicked lifestyle. Some people are your enemies because you have sinned against them and they are unwilling to forgive you, even though you may have asked or even begged for forgiveness. You know, this list could go on and on. One enemy at the present time is COVID-19. It is an unseen enemy. Uh, we are told and have been told for weeks and going on two months now that a person can be infected for 10 days or more and not even know it and be transmitting this disease to, to other people. Uh, certainly, COVID-19 is an enemy. And we need to pray for our leaders that they would stop their bickering, that they would uh, look to God for wisdom, and they would come together and work together. We're thankful for the somewhat that they have done, but it is certainly discouraging to uh, us as Americans that they continue to bicker and, and fight back and forth over things rather than pull together and meet together for prayer and fall before God and ask for his advice and his counsel and his wisdom. But we need to remember that, as I shared with you last week, our biggest enemy is the devil himself, Satan and his minion demons. demons. Satan is the accuser of the brother, brethren, Revelation 12, 10, and Job 1, 9 through 11. That is, he points out our sins and transgressions and iniquities to God. We don't fully know how this works or comprehend it. The Bible doesn't tell us an awful lot about it, but the book of Job tells us that Satan somehow enters in, in, to the throne room of God at some point and makes accusations against God's people. Well, you know, uh, other people point our sins out to us frequently, and certainly uh, we point our sins out to ourselves, but Satan himself is our enemy, pointing them out to God. And sometimes he'll point them out to us. Satan is also described in the scriptures as the wicked one, or some translations translate it the evil one. And he is the one who snatches away the word of God from the hearts and minds of people. This is recorded uh, and spoken by Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. Satan and the demons lead us astray and tempt us to commit evil and sin against God. Matthew again Chapter 4, verse 3, spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scriptures teach that Satan is the great deceiver, Revelation 20, verse 10, who uses his power, signs, and lying wonders to turn people away from the truth and away from God. That's recorded in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. My friends, when it comes to the enemy, you need to remember that he too can falsify miracles. He too can deceive us with lying wonders. We need to search the scriptures and to put people to the test of the word of God when they make claims to be the spokesperson of the Lord God of heaven. And so we need to rest in God when our enemies assault us. Rest in God alone. In, in our passage, we have a, in the Hebrew text, we have an interesting uh, construction here. We have a Hebrew word which is translated uh, truly, only, and surely in our passage. And it's found uh, one, two, three, four, five, six times, uh, actually seven times in our passage, I believe. Uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six times in our passage. Uh, one time translated truly, uh, four times translated only, and one time translated surely. It is the Hebrew word ak, and it is the first word in each of six verses in our passage. And basically, it means only. And, and uh, matter of fact, the Young Literal Translation translates verse 1 as, Only toward God is my soul silent. From Him is my salvation. And the, the Young's Literal Translation brings this out, uh, the emphasis of this Hebrew word in each of these stanzas uh, better than most of the other translations because it's trying to be more of a literal word-for-word uh, -word translation. You can see the flow of the Hebrew text trying to emphasize the, the, the specificity and the uniqueness and the emphasis that we need to put our faith in God and God alone. Derek Kidner uh, wrote these words, Not only 
these opening words, but the bulk of the first two stanzas, one through eight, are given extra force by the exclamation ak, translated truly or only, which, in, which introduces five out of the eight verses. It is an emphasizer to underline a statement or to point a contrast. Its insistence repetition gives the psalm a tone of special earnestness that in God and God alone is our hope, that in God and God alone is our refuge. Another writer says, circumstances of distress are described in which the poet turns to God as the only safe haven from the storm raging around him, the storm of life, uh, not particularly a, a physical storm, but the storm of life of whatever the circumstances were. There are no specific details in the psalm which point to a definite period, but the revolt of Absalom makes an, a, an appropriate setting, writes one commentator. And so, my friends, we need to rest in God when our enemies assault us and in God alone. But then our text in verse 1 talks about waiting. Truly my soul waits upon God. And so to rest in God, we need to wait in God. To, to wait on God means to rest in God. There are several translations I want to share with you to give you the different nuances of how this can be understood. They essentially mean the same thing. They're just expressing it a different way. Uh, the King James says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. The New King James says, truly my soul silently waits for God. Young says, toward God is my soul silent. Darby says, upon God alone does my soul rest peacefully. The American Standard and New American Standard of 19, uh, 1995 says, my soul waits in silence for God only. The ESV says, for God alone my soul waits in silence. And the 1984 edition of the New uh, NIV says, My soul finds rest in God alone. My friends, what gives you peace in a time of crisis? Who gives you peace in a time of crisis? Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. For he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and learn of me, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you should find rest for your souls. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. One writer says, F.F. F. Bruce says, My soul waits literally. My, my soul waits literally meaning to be silent, my soul. Another says stillness. It has the idea of humble resignation and quiet confidence in God. So to wait upon God is to wait in silence. To wait in stillness without fear and without anxiety. And yet, that temptation is always there. That temptation to complain and to murmur as Israel did of old. And so, just a couple of practical suggestions. To wait upon God in silence, and I know this is going to sound kind of contradictory, but choose a favorite hymn and sing it. Find good Christian music that uplifts your soul and, and turn it on and listen to it. And don't allow Satan to fill your mind and fill your heart with discouragement and distraction. Give thanks to the Lord in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The, that this part is to, to give thanks. Uh, God wants us to be thankful. You know, it could always be worse. And so when you feel that you're becoming fearful or anxious, rest in God as your rock and your fortress. Look again at, at verse uh, 1 and 2. Truly my soul waits upon God. From him comes my salvation. He only, or Hebrew text, only he is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And so we see that we can rest in God because he is our rock. It, if you looked at the, uh, the uh, artwork that was shared at the beginning of the broadcast and in some of the others, you'll find that there is a a, a coming from a view of a cave and a, and a mountain high and lift up. You see the valley uh, down below. The idea is that God is that defense. God is that place for which we can go to, be, to hide in metaphorically. God is the one in whom we can find our strength and our refuge. The first time uh, this word rock is found in the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, where the word of God says, Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb, 
and you shall smite the rock. Both of those words rock are the same word here. And there shall come water out of it, and people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he, came, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? You know, when times get hard, and it was very hard on the Israelites at that time, they were uh, l running low on water. And they started complaining to Moses that they had no water. Well, Moses did the right thing. He went to the Lord in prayer. He got alone, talked to the Lord about it, and the Lord told him what to do. And that's what we read about there, where he told him to go before the rock at Horeb and to smite that rock. The writer of Hebrews tells us that that rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ dying on Calvary's cross, smitten for our sins. And it was the sins of the people and their murmuring and complaining that necessitated this rock to be smitten. My friends, sin separates us from God. But God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. And that by putting our faith in him, we can have life and have it more abundantly. And we can have a rock and a refuge during any time of crisis, whether it's a pandemic or, or whether it's a, an auto accident or whether it's the unexpected passing of a loved one or perhaps a financial difficulty, which many of you are probably going through, no doubt, right now. The second time this word is used is also found in the book of Exodus. It's found in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 and following. And he, Moses, said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, You cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock. There's our word. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. There's that word again. And will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face you shall not see. Uh, this wonderful passage of God's grace and mercy to Moses, showing him uh, in a human manifestation of God walking by, was the inspiration for Fanny Crosby's song when she wrote these words. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. My friends, are you hiding in the cleft of the rock where the Lord has put you at this time to be safe from this virus, to be safe from your enemies? Not only is the Lord our rock, but verse 2 tells us that the Lord is our salvation. Uh, the word can be translated salvation or deliverance. It's translated both ways in, in the King James Bible. In Psalm 88, verse 1, it's translated with using the word salvation again. And it says, O Lord God of my salvation, O Jehovah Elohim of my deliverance, you could translate it. I have cried day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you and incline your ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws nigh unto the grave. And certainly, there are families who feel that way. Families whose loved ones are hanging between life and eternity. Families who've lost loved ones recently, they are in all their troubles. And we need to encourage them and, and pray for them and, and love them as best we can from afar. And I would encourage you, if you know anybody like that, give them a phone call. Uh, send them a card or uh, words of encouragement, 
a text message or something to, to be a comfort to them. Uh, perhaps you can uh, have something ordered to be dropped off at their home or drop it off at their front door as well. Uh, that's because God is our salvation. He is the one who delivers us and he wants us to comfort those who are in times of trouble and sorrow. It's translated also by the word deliverance in Psalm 18, verse 50, which says, Great deliverance gives he to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. My friends, it is God and God alone who provides salvation. Jesus said, "For by, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The apostles clearly understood that message as Peter repeated, uh, in essence, that same saying in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, where he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The first time I heard the word saved in a religious context was when I was in junior high school in Winter Haven, Florida, Dennis, Dennis, and El, uh, Dennis, Dennis and Junior High School. I was in the library, and uh, one of the other students came and shared with the librarian that day, so-and-so got saved on Sunday. I had no clue what they were talking about. I thought that someone was rescued from drowning uh, because I had been rescued uh, from a near-drowning experience one time. It wasn't until later that I realized that they were talking about salvation of this person's soul. They were talking about this person was delivered from the bondage of sin, delivered from the penalty of sin, and someday delivered from the very presence of sin. My friend, is your salvation in God or is your salvation and your deliverance in yourself? Ourselves will fail us, but God will never fail us. Our text also tells us in verse 2, not only is he our rock, not only is he our salvation, our deliverance, but it tells us there in verse 2 that he is my defense or he is our defense. This word has the idea of a, a high place, an exalted place, a fortress uh, that could be used like the, the imagery that we put on the, on the screen earlier uh, in the uh, presentation today. It is a place where we are safe from the onslaught of our enemies. It can be used to, for the word a stronghold. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 9, the word of God says, The Lord also will be a refuge, there's our word, for the same word defense. He is a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge for in the time of trouble. Oh, my friend, go to the Lord. He will not reject you. He eagerly opens his arms to receive you if you come in humility and repentance to him. In Psalm chapter 18, verse 2, the word of God says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation. And here it is in this passage, my high tower. If you've looked at any... Uh, ancient fortresses or any medieval fortresses, you know that there's always a high tower. That is the supposedly the most secure and safe place in the fortress. And the imagery here by the psalmist is that is where God puts us in his own arms as our high tower, as our fortress. And so the psalmist in Psalm 18 then resolves, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, who shall so shall I be saved or delivered from mine enemies. Alan Ross wrote these words. A warrior used, a warriors, excuse me, as warriors used to feel at ease in an impregnable fortress, so David rested in the Lord. Just as a, a, a warrior would retreat to that strongest portion of the fortress and believing and knowing that he was secure there, David retreated to the God of his salvation. And so God is our rock. God is our salvation. God is our defense. But we also need to understand that our declaration of faith should result from that. Look at the latter part of verse 2. I shall not be greatly moved. In other words, I will not have my faith stripped away from me. I will not have my faith the, the rug pulled out from under the rug of faith pulled out from me, so to speak. I will stand strong and, and firm in my confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the salvation savior of my life and of my soul and the one who will deliver me through this time of pandemic and deliver me from what other enemies uh, that I might face. We need to understand that we need to give glory to God 
And that is what the psalmist David here declares when he says, I shall not be moved. Woodrow Cole wrote these words. The adverb, the adverb greatly indicates the psalmist is like a tree swaying in the wind, bent but not broken, as a ship moored in the harbor is buffeted but not destroyed. Yes, we will bend. Yes, we will, the storm of life will beat upon us. But we can declare with confidence that our God will not abandon us. Our God will not deliver us unto the enemy. But we need to understand that there is a real assault. Look at verses 3 and 4. How long have you imagined mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a, bow, as a bowing wall ye, shall ye be as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down with, from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Uh, vivid description of our enemies is found in this passage. It is addressed to the persecutors in the indignation of their unjust treatment of the psalmist. Also perhaps suggesting the futility of their effort to fall to the ground. One who is upheld by God. The Hebrew verb occurs only here, and its root meaning is to rush upon a person with menacing cries and a hand raised to strike them, writes one commentary. The tottering fence. If you drive around our community and you go to some areas or out in the country, every once in a while you're going you're to see a, a fence that looks like a strong wall would come down and just blow it over, or a a, a, a stone wall. We have a lot of stone walls in, in Pennsylvania. You'll see some of these stone walls. They're starting to crumble. They're starting to fall down. The accusation of the enemies is that's exactly how we are, that they are almost successful in, in, in tearing us down or blowing us over, as the bad wolf would say, to huff and to puff and blow your fence down. We need to understand that God will not allow that to, hop, to happen. The image of a tottering fence suggests weakness, and susceptibility, and they wrongly believe that we are weak, but our strength is in our God. Our strength is in who He is, not in who we are. Our strength is in His steadfast, loyal love to us, not our faith in Him, but His steadfast, loyal love. For Jesus said, if your faith be so small as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be cast in the sea, and it shall be done. You see, my friends, it is not that we don't have faith. It is that we don't use what we have. And we need to focus on our God and not on us, not on our faith, but on his faithfulness, on his steadfast, loyal love, on his promises never to abandon us in any time of trial or tribulation. Our God is faithful. Evil being ruthlessly competitive is attracted to weakness to give the last punch, punch to whatever is leaning or tottering, wrote Kidner. But David said, I will not be moved. But his enemies, in contrast to that, notice what they say. They bless with their mouths in verse 4. They 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 uh they, they come upon us and they speak kind words, but inwardly they curse at us. They mock us. They make fun of us behind our back. Beware of wolves in sheep clothing. Beware of false prophets. The scriptures tell us in many places to try the spirits, to compare what they say with the truth of the word of God. And I would encourage you to constantly compare what I say to the truth of the Word of God. And if you find that I'm in error, please feel free to reach out in love and to say, you might want to rethink this through or something like that. Because our authority is not in ourselves. Our authority is in the Word of God and in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. My friends, God and God alone is our refuge and our salvation during crisis. We need to trust God always. That's the whole idea of this Hebrew word at the front of six of these verses. Only in God is my refuge. Only in God is my hiding place, so to speak. Only in God. There's a great song, God and God Alone. Uh, probably out of my range now. I don't sing quite as high as I used to, but it's a beautiful song. 
God and God alone. The person who trusts God for his deliverance is the person who focuses on God. Uh, One Kidner writes these words in verses 5 and 6. Repeat the opening refrain, but modify its tone and voice by three small nuances. In other words, verse 5 is very similar uh, to verse 1. That's the whole idea there. But there's a slight change here uh, in the way that it's done. And Kidner makes these observations. Number one, David now now urges on himself the silence which he simply stated in verse 1. In other words, it's one thing for us to say to the world, uh, my faith is in God. But then we get alone and Satan starts to buffet us. Satan starts to attack us. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves what we said publicly and openly, that in God and God alone is my faith and my strength and my, my power. That's when we need to sing to God alone. That's when we need to lift up our voices in prayer that God would sustain us. You realize that Satan came to Jesus and tempted him when he was alone. And those times when we're alone is sometimes when we're the most vulnerable. But Jesus used the word of God and thwarted Satan. Jesus focused on God the Father to give him the strength that he needed. And when the temptation was over, the angels came and ministered to him. So... Not only do we need to proclaim publicly our faith in God, but we need to remind ourselves privately that our faith is in God. Second observation by Kinder. The second change is simply one of style, submitting hope for salvation. In other words, in verse 1, he says, God is my salvation. In verse 5, uh, he says, God alone, uh, my soul wait thou upon, only upon God. The idea there is his hope, his confidence, his steadfastness, is in God. My expectation is from Him. The expectation of God's deliverance, the steadfast assurance that God will deliver His children. And then thirdly, the third is very positive. Strengthening the partial confidence of the second verse, not greatly moved, to become the unqualified assurance, I shall not be moved. In other words, he says in verse uh, 1, Or verse 2, it's highly unlikely that I'll be moved. It's highly improbable that I'll be moved. But now in verse 5, he makes that bold proclamation, I shall not be moved. My expectation is in him. And so the person who trusts God has an expectation of God's rescue. Are you looking for the coming of the Lord? Are you looking for the deliverance of the Lord, Maranatha? Are, you, are, your, are your eyes lifted up to heaven and says, even so come now, Lord Jesus? We need to constantly be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. He could come at any moment to catch his bride away. My friend, are you part of the bride of Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone as your Savior? Because only those who are putting their faith, their eternal destiny, in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ will be caught up in the rapture to be with the Lord. And they will then have to endure the great tribulation. I've had some friends contact me and says, uh, is it possible that uh, we're in the tribulation? I said, no, this is, this is a cakewalk compared to what the tribulation is going to be. This is nothing compared to what the plague and the pestilence is going to come during the time of the tribulation. One third of the earth's population will die. Now, I want you to think about that in light of some of the newscasts you've been hearing, that science will defeat this. Science will get the upper hand on this. My friends, there is coming a day that science will not help the world. That it will be at the the mercy of the plague, of the pestilence, whatever it will be, that will kill one-third of the earth's population. You don't want to be there. And you don't have to be there. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord promises he will not reject those who come into him in sincerity and in truth. A person who trusts God has stability. Look at verse 6. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. A person who trusts in God will give God praise. Look at verse 7. In God is my salvation or in God is my deliverance. My glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. I hope after this is all over 
and we can meet back together, that there are some people ready to say, Pastor, can I give a testimony? Pastor, I got some things to share. Oh, Pastor, let's have a testimony meeting. You know, a lot of times testimony means like pulling teeth. But, you know, that's not the way it should be. It should be people who say, I will give praise to God for what he has done. I will give praise to God for the way he has sustained me and strengthened me, both materialistically, both with food, both with shelter, but spiritually as well. I shall give praise to God. One writer says, It was right to speak frankly of the traitors and their plots in the first stanza. Now is David's wisdom to brood on them no longer. He will fill his thoughts with God. That's why I tell you over and over again, focus on God. Don't focus on your persecutors. Don't focus on your hardships. Don't focus on your enemies. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. And so we need to understand that God and God alone is our refuge and our salvation during crisis. And we need to realize that Judgment Day will put everything in proper perspective. Judgment Day will put everything in proper perspective. Look at verse 9. Surely or truly men of low degree are vanity. It's, it's, in other words, like you go out in the morning when, when you can breathe and you see the mist go out and then all of a sudden it disappears. That's what it means to be vanity or a vapor. And men of high degree are a lie. So in other words, he's, he's, he's talking about the lowest of, of the social stratus. He's talking about the highest of the social stratus. He says, to be laid in the balance and they are altogether lighter than vanity. Both the low and the high, apart from their salvation in Jesus Christ, they are a vapor. They are vanity. Their social status will not help them when they stand in judgment day. Their low degree will not help them when they stand in judgment day. Only their relationship with Jesus Christ. I can remember as a child, I cannot remember not believing in Jesus Christ as a person. I've always believed the Bible. I went to church when people would invite me to go to church, and I encourage you to do the same. You'd be surprised how many people, when this is over, when you invite them to come to church, will come. Now, sometimes you have to ask over and over again, but don't give hope. But many times that's when people go is because somebody invites them to go, invites them to come. But, you know, to me, Jesus was a historical figure. There was no personal relationship. And then in August of 1971 in West Palm Beach, Florida, Calvary Baptist Church, I, I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's when those facts became personal and that personal relationship took over my life. I did not fully comprehend it, but as I started attending church, I began to understand and grow more in my knowledge of the Bible, began to understand what God was doing in my life. And so we need to understand that it is not a head knowledge with Jesus that helps us, but a personal relationship. And that personal relationship begins by calling upon, admitting that we are a sinner. A, admit that you're a sinner, condemned, unclean, and in need of a Savior. B, believe the message that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to, to die on Calvary's cross for your sins and to raise, again, victorious from sin, death, hell, and the grave to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for you, to believe that message that Jesus died for you because he loves you and he doesn't want you to suffer an eternity in hell. And then C, call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Simply to admit your need as a Savior, admit your sinner, admit your condemned unclean, believe the message of the Bible about Jesus, and then call upon Him. Now, if you do that and it's genuine, then you're going to become a new person. For if any man uh, be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. You can go through those motions, but if your life doesn't change, it, it, you didn't, it didn't stick. It wasn't the real McCoy. Because God searches the depths of our hearts and knows the sincerity of it. And Jesus said that by our fruits, he will know us. But judgment day is coming. And people in the judgment day, they're, they're like a vapor. Uh, all the wealth that they accumulated, it won't matter on judgment day. 
The size of your house, the, the expensive car, the expensive clothes, the, the, the expensive uh, gadgetry that you might have technologically wise, none of that will matter. It all becomes a vapor. The word man here, or the word people here, men in verse 9, is the word Adam. There's, there's more than one word in the Old Testament for man, and this is the word Adam. And here's, what, here's why that word is used here. Adam stresses the earthiness of who we are. Adam stresses the weakness of who we are and that we are temporal. But there's coming a day when this earth will be destroyed and God will create all things new with a new heavens and a new earth and we will need to be properly suited to live there. We did a message on that several weeks ago. Woodrow Crowe writes these words, Having surveyed the heights of the glorious God, now the psalmist surveys the depths of man's vanity. Unlike God, man is nothing but vanity. The crowds of ancient Jerusalem crowd, Hosanna one day! And then, crucify him, crucify him! Just a few days later. And so you see that we're, we're vain people. We, we constantly change our minds. We constantly look the other way. The psalmist in another passage in Psalm 103, verse 15 says, As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it and is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. The idea there is talking about our life on this earth is temporary. Dr. Arthur Steele used to say, What are three score and ten years compared to eternity? And so we need to make sure that we're prepared for eternity. One commentator writes regarding verses 9 and 10, the psalmist warned that it is foolish to trust in humans. People are nothing but breath, a vapor. Place the wicked on a balance scale and their side goes up since their weight is as much as a vapor. In other words, you, you, here's, here's the person and because it's, it's a vapor, it, it's like this. There's nothing to hold it. There's nothing to balance it. My friend, God doesn't take our good works and our, and our, and our bad works and balances them out. Because our good works are vanity. Our good works are nothing. The scriptures describe it says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The best that I have to offer God apart from Jesus Christ, the best that I have to offer God in my atomness is like a dirty old diaper. I was a liberated parent. I changed lots of diapers. I got news for you. I washed my hands two and three and maybe sometimes four times over after doing that. I didn't want that mess on my hands. And the best that I have to offer God is a dirty old diaper. And so that's why we need the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. For God hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. My friends, are you trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Look at verse 10. He says, Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. My friends, people are but a vapor when it comes to standing before God. Their good works are, are empty. But secondly, your riches will not save you. That's the bottom line of that passage. Our riches will not save us. And look at verse 11. He says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs unto God. Power, authority belongs to God and God alone. Another great hymn, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. To God and God alone be the glory. The word here has the idea of strength. It can mean material or physical. It can mean social or political. And my friends, no matter what way you want to look at it, God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. Ross writes again, David heard God say two things, that he is strong and loving, so justice will be meted out to everybody, and how much better then to find rest in the powerful God than in human devices. You see, God is a just God. God is omniscient. He knows everything. It's not like going to a human uh, uh, judge who doesn't have the uh, uh, ability to be omniscient. He can only uh, make his ruling based on the evidence that presented before him. But the God of the universe, um, he doesn't need any evidence. He already knows all of it. And he will judge righteously and justly. 
And he will know whether our profession of faith in Jesus Christ is real or whether it's a phoniness or whether it's fake. Is your faith in Jesus Christ like a vapor? Are you just spouting out words? Or does your life demonstrate that you're a follower of the living God? Look at verse 12. This is the climax in, of this wonderful passage. Also unto me, also unto thee, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to every man according to his works. Those are two distinct contrasted portions in verse 12. Hebrew poetry is not, doesn't rhyme like English poetry does. Hebrew poetry is logical. And what he's telling us here in the first part of this verse is mercy, God's steadfast, loyal love, belongs to God. We read another passage where God uh, told uh, Moses in Exodus, he is the one who chooses to whom he gives mercy. He is the one, one who makes certain decisions. And so we need to go to God to fall upon his mercy, to fall upon his steadfast, loyal love. This is the covenant word of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, if you want to use a New Testament uh, parallel. It is translated many different ways, mostly in the King James by the word mercy. But the, a better translation is God's steadfast, loyal love. And so we find here that it is God who gives that stead. It is his to give. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God will not reject a repentant sinner genuinely coming to him. He eagerly awaits to give you his free gift of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, again, would be like an, a, a Greek or New Testament parallel to the word mercy here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, we're not saved by works, but we are saved to do works for God. To do things for the glory of God, for the honor of God. Because we love him and because his love is shed upon us. Yes, God's mercy is, is great. But the latter part of that verse stresses that God's judgment is certain. He says, For you renderest to every man according to his works. I, Pastor, I hear, I hear a, a discrepancy there. God's mercy, but I'm going to be judged by my works? Yes. You, if you end up in hell, you're going to be judged by your works. And the severity of your punishment will be based on your works on earth. But your presence there is not based upon your works. Your presence there would be based upon your rejection of Jesus Christ and your unwillingness to believe on him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on the, on the Son is not condemned. Listen carefully. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, the day I was born, I was born a sinner. Nobody had to teach me how to lie. Nobody had to teach me how to steal. Nobody had to teach me how to thief, how to cheat. Nobody had to teach me how to do wicked things. I came by that naturally because I was a child of Adam. And I inherited the sin nature that is upon him. And so I'm condemned already. But God saved me from that. And God will save you if you call upon him. But then again, for those who have trusted Jesus Christ, they too will be judged by their works. Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians, For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ, that we might receive the things which we have done in the body, whether they be good or whether they bad. Now, the, the bad there is not sin. The bad there is not as good as it could be. Illustration would be for the Olympics, a person who expected to win the gold medal, and they ended up with a bronze, and they despised it sometimes. You, you find that once in a while. They despised the bronze medal because they were cheated. They should have had the gold. No, they, the person who got the gold did their best, and, and they got it because they did their best on and, and that given day and that given time in history. That other person, though they're still standing on the podium, they're not happy because they didn't do as good as they thought they could have done or, or they knew they could have done. That's what the bad in that passage is talking about. But nevertheless, the Bible says they're saved so as by fire. And so, my friends, 
judgment day is certain. Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. Listen carefully to that verse. It is appointed unto men once to die. One time. Not to come back as something else and die again. Not to come back as something else and to die again. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And so my friends, God and God alone is our refuge and our salvation during a crisis. And so I hope that you are resting in God during this time of crisis when enemies assault and assail us. Trust in God always, not sometimes, but always. And remember, judgment day is coming. At this time, uh, Andrew is going to come and lead us in our closing hymn, a shelter in the time of storm, and then he'll lead us in our closing prayer for today. shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of Let's pray together. Father, certainly uh, this land is weary uh, of inconvenience, yes, of problems, yes, of, of uh, political problems, yes, but Lord, uh, fear, uh, uncertainty of the future, uh, not knowing what your plans are specifically, Lord, we have your promises to rest on, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We know who holds the future, though, and that's you. We know that our times are in your hand and that you have a plan that you're working out, whatever it is. Help us to rest in you, trust in you, and to be lights and witnesses uh, in, with the opportunities that you give us in this unique time in human history. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us, and may we trust you more in this time of difficulty. In Jesus' name, amen.